Well, hi, and thank you for tuning in to our Calvary Chapel Louisville broadcast. I'm Pastor Rock. We'll be picking up today in Genesis chapter 48, so let's get started with prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. We ask for your abundance to speak to our heart and just fill us to overflowing by your Holy Spirit so that we can go out and take what we learn into every place where you intend for us to go. Bless this time and anoint it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 48. A little bit of background from the previous chapter. You'll recall that uh, Joseph brings Jacob uh, back to, well, over to Egypt and uh, presents him to Pharaoh. Jacob at that time is 130 years old. And uh, verse 27, he goes on and uh, spends the time there. The whole nation of Israel really is there uh, through the famine. And while the famine continues, the Israelites are prospering because they're set apart specifically by Joseph. And then later in the next verse, verse 28, uh, Jacob has Joseph swear to him not to leave his body there in Egypt after his death, but to bury him in Hebron with Abraham and uh, Isaac. So uh, the, the three patriarchs would be there. So that's what we're picking up. In verse 48, uh, we, I'm sorry, in chapter 48, we begin, verse 1, Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself up, strengthened himself and sat up on his bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of of Canaan and blessed me. So here we see that there'd some been some years that had passed, 17 years specifically. Jacob's 147 at this point, and the word is is that he is on his deathbed, so they call for Joseph to come. And when he hears that Joseph is coming, and especially when he's coming with his uh, children, who would be Jacob's grandchildren, of course, that He's strengthened by that. And I think that that's fascinating here that we see that he's been bed, bedridden, but he hears word, look, your son Joseph is coming to you, and Israel, and notice it says Israel at this point, not just uh, Jacob, but it says Israel, speaking of in terms of the nation and the strength of the nation at the coming of Joseph and the and the blessings that would follow as a result for Joseph's sons. So it's, he strengthens himself and sits up on the bed. And there's just some things to, to be said about that. When, when we visit other people, when we uh, hear that there's going to be a visit, then we can, we can be strengthened by that and, and that the Spirit can kind, kind of come into us and, and we can sometimes find ourselves having strength that we didn't have previously. And certainly we see this taking place with Jacob at this point there's um, something to be said about that as that relates to ministering uh, to people in nursing homes folks that are older that they may be in a situation where they're very sick and and unable to get up out of bed and yet when they hear of visitations taking place that they that they have this renewed strength and so we need to be mindful of this that there's a ministry that takes place there uh, on top of that, the word tells us in Hebrews that uh, we're not supposed to forsake ourselves the gathering with saints, that we are supposed to come together and that there's a strengthening that takes place there. So we can, we need to be attending uh, times of, of fellowship and gatherings of the saints and we need to know that we could be part of strengthening other people as well as we're strengthened by that. So just an important verse that uh, has a lot of implications to it. So as we move on, though, he strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, or Luz, in the land of Canaan and blessed me. So that's Bethel. And he goes on and he says in verse 4, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. This is what, well, this is what the Lord said, and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your sons 
Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Now we're going to come around to this a little bit more, but basically, even though that would seem kind of strange what he's doing, Israel, or Jacob, is adopting for himself Joseph's two sons. And what he is doing is he's elevating those sons from a position of grandsons to a position of being patriarchs and this is fascinating and it has implications later having to do with adoptions as Christians as well but what we see specifically taking place here is the double portion that is coming to Joseph as the favored firstborn son is now doubling out or splitting it's been likened to like a stock split that now the blessings are going to go to Manasseh and to Ephraim as they would normally go to Joseph and this is what we see when you uh, look at the tribes of Israel and when they're counted out we generally don't see Joseph's name being listed but we'll see instead Ephraim and Manasseh so with that said it's a it's a blessing that's coming down to the grandchildren and what that does is, once again, it places them on par with the other brothers. You could even argue that it places them ahead of Reuben and Simeon, who are the literal firstborn sons of Jacob, but through Joseph that these two would sort of be the, the favored that would take that position. So it's very fascinating how this unfolds. In addition to that, when you consider who the... 12 tribes of Israel are you have the the 12 sons and then you have these two additional sons or grandsons that are brought into that position and at various times as the children of Israel are noted sometimes it's referenced as Joseph but usually it's referenced as Ephraim and Manasseh and when it talks about the territorial um, divisions that are given that Ephraim and Manasseh are part of the 12 tribes so that you would think that would be 13 but then Levi doesn't actually uh, receive a an inheritance or a portion of land as they're going to be in throughout the land and serve and minister so you have the 12 tribes plus uh, plus um, Levi so that would be like 13 or anyway you Hopefully you understand that or you can go through the scriptures and see how that unfolds. But it is pretty fascinating. And again, in, as we look into Revelation, the, the way that that counts out is a little bit different as well. So they're adopted. Ephraim and Manasseh or Manasseh and Ephraim are adopted and their identities would be found with the brothers or the patriarchs. They would now be elevated to that position. But as for me, when I came to Paddan... Uh, when I came from Paddan, which would be from Laban, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way. And uh, when there was but a little distance to go to Eph Ephrath, and I was and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, which is uh, Ben, which is Bethlehem here. So uh, we heard about that. We we read that story some some chapters back as far as what had taken place there. And then it goes on in verse eight where Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, who are these? Now, again, when he had first visited Pharaoh and come into the land of Egypt, Jacob was 130 years old. Now, 17 years had passed, so he's 147, and his eyes were, were dim. He, was, he, he could barely see at this point. Um, I'm sure that for him, it was just at this point, uh, just figures and, and shadows but he wasn't like completely blind in blackness, but he couldn't differentiate much. And that reminds me actually of, of Isaac back in um, Genesis yeah, verse chapter 27, that when, when Isaac was bringing, going to bless Jacob and Esau, that he was blind. And you'll remember the story having to do with uh, the skins and sending out Esau and saying, okay, I'm going to bless you. And then Jacob impersonating Esau and stealing the blessing 
so to speak. So he's nearly blind here. And in verse 9 it says, And Joseph said to his father, These are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now, as I mentioned, the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And this this must have just been an awesome thing here where the the grandsons are here and, and he embraces them and kisses them and, and just loves on them. And it's, anyway, as his own sons. And so it goes on in verse 11, Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring and that's awesome he never he, he thought that Joseph was lost and gone killed and he, that was the done deal and now he's seeing his grandchildren or his children Joseph's children and it was just an awesome awesome thing for him to to see it, it would be unimaginable and he's here he is at the end of his life and he sees these sons of Joseph so Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth verse 12 there and because 17 years had passed since Jacob had come to Egypt Manasseh and Ephraim were were already born you'll remember they were born sometime during those years of plenty and then Jacob and the all of the children of Israel ended up moving there in the second year of the famine so nine years had had passed there so Joseph between the time he was 30 to 37 had these children and now he's uh, 56 so that's telling us that these kids are anywhere between 19 and 26 years old but I think it's fascinating that it says Joseph brought them from beside his knees now that's of course showing the relationship that he has that these are his children that they're that they're from his loins so to speak but that they were that they were there close and it also speaks to the fact that the children were very close these these lads these young young men 19 to 26 years old whatever their age to ages were for the two of them that here they are that close to uh, that close to Joseph and you know we live in a culture which is very not close and here we see them very very close and it's it's just a a remarkable thing something to to acknowledge and it speaks to how we should relate to one another in our families that there should be a close knittedness and uh, relative proximity that we have with one another that we don't need to be so distant and there's there's so much more that I could say about that just having to do with child rearing and the sizes of our houses and uh, the way we conduct our lives but um, we'll, we'll move on. It's, it's really something where we should stay close with one another. So, where are we? From beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. So, he, you know, here he's bowing down, and then he's presenting his two sons there. And, of course, Jacob is 147. Joseph's probably about 55, 56 at this time. Verse 13, Joseph took them both, Ephraim, with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and he brought them near. So this is significant because basically, even though Manasseh was in the left hand area from Joseph's standpoint, he would have been on the right hand area for the blessing, and that the blessing was going to come from the right hand toward Manasseh, and because he was the older one. But there's a little bit of a switcheroo that had taken place here. We see in verse, let's see, verse 14, Then Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So basically what, what Jacob did was he switched his hands or crossed his hands. He put one on Ephraim and then the other on Manasseh. And so the the blessing was going to come the primary blessing or the predominant blessing was going to come from the from the right hand upon Ephraim's head who was the younger and we'll come back around to that some more but it's it's amazing pretty remarkable what's taking place there and we'll see that there's uh, a precedent for that or at least there's 
This is something that is not uncommon throughout uh, Genesis here and throughout the Bible. Verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, notice he blesses Joseph, but he's blessing the children. So uh, this is the way that Joseph's blessing is being seen is through these children. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of all of the earth. Now, again, as we're looking at these scripture verses, we're seeing that the blessing is coming through the children and you know it in our culture we're so preoccupied with receiving the blessing personally and and I believe that it's why we have kind of a lot of people that are drawing attention to themselves because they want to earn or gain the favor upon themselves instead of thinking long term and being of a right attitude and heart and disposition and being right before God and letting the blessing come to us through our children and our children's children and so on and really making that investment some people just they don't it's almost like they live that they don't even care about their children or their children's children they all they care about is themselves and their own personal relationship and walk whereas you know if we look at the relationship that the father had with Jesus it was one of abiding and it really does speak to the type of parenting that we should be doing and the way that we should relate to one another within our household that it's an abiding it's a relationship it's one where you're pouring into your children and you're spending that time you're not just putting them off and and dealing with them so anyway what we see here is that Jacob is is blessing Joseph but he's got his hands on Ephraim's head with his right hand and then Manasseh's head with his left hand and then he says these things he says God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has fed me all my life long to this day so the word there fed in verse 15 literally means shepherd to shepherd me the Lord who shepherded me shepherded me and it's the first reference of of God as our shepherd the shepherd of people uh, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he leads me in paths of righteousness and just continuing there through Psalm 23 and uh, it, here is where we see the precedent or the the background for that and then he goes on and he says in the angel and some of your translations may actually have that capitalized which is good it really emphasizes the fact that the angel of the Lord here was Jesus who had uh, come to Jacob and did these things he redeemed me from all evil and bless the lads let my name be upon them so the idea of redemption here is the exchange of of one thing for another and here we see that that Hebrew word is goel which we see referenced um, in the book of Ruth and and what it means is someone who's the savior or a deliverer for another person so the redemption that's taking place you're exchanging one thing for another or or uh, it would be like transferring or well you're just exchanging something you're exchanging sin for uh, eternal life and this is taking place or this is occurring through our Savior and this is what he's talking about here Jacob is fully aware of all of this and he's making references prophetically to who Jesus is being the uh, the Redeemer so he says bless the lads let my name be upon them which is pretty awesome let my name the, the name of Israel be upon them that that's what their identity would be and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth so very again remarkable blessing that's coming down on these children which is really the blessing that's coming to Joseph Joseph could have walked away from that and said man I didn't get anything out of that but what he's seeing is the blessing that's coming to his children and the, the multiplication of, of God's grace upon them and the subsequent generations which follow. And I hope that, uh, I pray that everybody has that sort of a perspective with regard to how they see 
future events that it doesn't have to come down upon us specifically, but it can be something that's a blessing for for those who would follow after us. And praise the Lord that we've had people in the church that have laid down their lives for us, beginning with Jesus, so that we can have and experience what we have. And then even within our country, the United States, that there have been people that have sacrificed their lives at a very young age so that you and I would have the the ability to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So uh, pretty awesome, pretty awesome to be able to exercise those things. So again, uh, the angel would have been Jesus there that was uh, referenced and the uh, reference point for that in the scriptures, Genesis 32, verse 30, and then the redemption, Goel. Uh, in the Hebrew. Verse 17, Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. So here it's displeasing to Joseph. He's There's a blessing that's coming down and, and Jacob's got his hands reversed here. And Joseph's trying to correct this. Maybe he's thinking that, well, Jacob's kind of lost it a little bit, or he's not just lost his eyesight, but that there's a bigger problem that's taking place. And notice that it says he's displeased with this. You know what I think is fascinating is that Joseph is in a position as prime minister and had been for, well, let's see, what would this be up, up to this point? So 17 years plus nine years, that would be 26 years he's been prime minister over Egypt and that's a pretty heady position and I'm sure that he was used to correcting a lot of things and making sure things were right and here he's making a correction to his father making an assumption with regard to this blessing and it's displeasing him and we'll end up finding out in the next verse that this was very very intentional what Jacob was doing so if we're in any position of authority or management we still need to humble ourselves to know especially with regard to if we wanted to be very specific with this illustration with regard to those people that are older than us to not just go on the assumption that hey they they're getting old and their minds aren't quite right and and to dishonor them by by not receiving or by becoming displeased with something that they're doing but to begin to acknowledge you know there may be a great blessing here or there may be something that God is doing very specifically through them in their old age and to not look down upon that but to honor them no matter how high our position may happen to be uh, to humble ourselves and know that that God is is working through these people that are older than us through through these seniors so what does it say in verse 19? But his father, Jacob, refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall also, or he also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. So he's talking about Manasseh. Jacob, excuse me, Joseph is saying Manasseh should be the one getting the right hand blessing. And here Jacob is correcting him and saying, no, I know what I'm doing. And the greater blessing is going to Ephraim. Manasseh is going to be blessed as well. Specifically, it tells us that he'll become a great people, but or he'll become a people and he shall also be great. But truly, verse 19, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. And that's fascinating. We'll see uh, what that means here very shortly. But it's fascinating to me or, or pretty noteworthy that Jacob knows exactly what he's doing and he's dealing in a prophetic sense here as he's relating to Joseph and these two sons who are now, as he would regard, his two sons, patriarchs on par with Reuben and Simeon and, and so on. So, he says, I know, I know, or I know my son, I know. And uh, again, clarifying that uh, he has a, a clarity of speech or he, he knows what he's doing here. And then in addition to that, it, he says, and his descendants, speaking of Ephraim, shall become a multitude of nations. And we'll look forward into this a, a little bit. And there will be some notes down below 
in the the video with respect to this but Ephraim would later Jeroboam would be from the tribe of Ephraim so you remember there was uh, David first the first king of course was Saul and then after that it was David King David and then Solomon and then after Solomon there was a split in the kingdom and the tribe of Judah went to Rehoboam because of his pride and, and arrogance and in his leadership and, and governing there was an alternate because of the split there was an alternate that was set up that ended up taking the ten tribes of Israel to himself and that took place through Jeroboam who was an Ephraimite and of course Jeroboam was trying to later on trying to offset people returning to Judah because of Jerusalem and and returning to worship there so he established uh, places of worship all throughout the northern kingdom which generally we have the tribe of Judah down south and then through Jeroboam and the and the kings that would follow they would be from the tribes or they would be regarded as a tribe or, or the nation I guess you could say of Israel but that's used synonymously as Ephraim and so that's a fascinating clarification his descendants shall be a multitude of nations where the basically Ephraim would be made up of the these other tribes of Israel so and and you could even maybe go further than that because of the idolatry and the worldliness that was introduced there uh, the, you know there were other nations that were built off of that as well so the main thing to note here is that uh, from this verse though is not so much talking about the multitude of nations that would follow that was important but notice here it says his younger brother shall be greater than he and in this case what we see is the second is being blessed and we see that all throughout the Bible we see it uh, definitely in in the book of uh, Genesis here where there was Cain and Abel and Abel was the one who was blessed and Ishmael and Isaac and Isaac was the one who was blessed Esau and Jacob and Jacob was the one that was blessed and um, Leah and Rachel of course Rachel was the one who was blessed even in terms of the second where you had Reuben who was the firstborn but then the firstborn from Rachel Joseph was the one who was blessed and received that higher position and then later on we see Aaron and Moses and there's a lot of other examples as we go on through even as it re relates to things pertaining to uh, we could say testaments the, the first testament um, the, or the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament and how we, looking at these we see that the first comes and things are defined but the greater establish, establishment comes through the second and that could be seen on even the Genesis account there in chapter 1 of Genesis where the firmament is specifically divided or the, the firmament is created and it divides the waters from the waters and so basically it establishes the things between earth which was part of the creation and then heaven itself and that well I'll move on to this idea but that it you know separating the earthly from the heavenly and then you know second we see the witness of God where all things are established by two or three witnesses and that the first thing is established but the the thing that's really important or that brings the concreteness of a decision is the fact that you have the the second witness and that's where the strength comes in the first uh, declaration and then lastly we see that in a general sense we see that the the future always exceeds the things of the past and what I mean by that is that you know things are great right now maybe they're not great right now for you but even if we were thinking man this is these are the these are great times and I'm loving this and you know like right now I have a, a canopy over our head on our backyard and it's a very enjoyable we don't have the Sun beating down but we can relax a little bit in some chairs and it's a very nice to be able to do that but what's coming after is going to be a lot better what's following this is going to far 
exceed anything that is uh, that we're experiencing right now so to always be of the understanding that what God is going to provide or what God is going to do will always be better than than what he's doing now so in that sense we see this second blessing or I'm sorry we see the blessing coming to the second in a lot of examples now if you're firstborn that doesn't mean that God's cursing you or anything along that line or if you're the third in line or any of those things if you're the sixth child it doesn't I'm not trying to go too far with this but we do see this throughout the Bible as an example of the second being used for for a unique kind of blessing so moving on from this and again there will be some more notes down below from the uh, video here so verse 20 so he blessed them that day saying by you Israel will bless saying may God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh and thus he said Ephraim before Manasseh verse 21 then Israel said to Joseph behold I'm dying but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your fathers now this was prophesied also to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and it refers to both Joseph he's saying God's going to be with you and he's going to bring you back to the land of Canaan to the promised land but it's not just going to be you Joseph in fact it's going to be all of the house of Israel and fascinatingly enough that uh, Joseph after he had died uh, some 55 years later somewhere along that line when he had died and the 400 years had had passed according to the prophecy that in, from that standpoint when when the children of Israel returned under Joseph I'm sorry under Joshua that they ended up burying Joseph there at Shechem and as we'll see in the next verse here there's a reference but ended up burying him there when they when they came in and actually conquered the the promised land so uh, verse 22 will wrap up moreover I've given to you one portion above your brothers which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. So one portion here, the the literal word there is has a meaning for shoulder or like a ridge. And if you'll go back some chapters, we find out that that word itself is Shechem. So there's a unique blessing that's that's given from the standpoint of Shechem, given over to Joseph in this regard and as I mentioned that's where he was actually buried and that's in reference to Joshua chapter 24 verse 32 that he was buried there in Shechem and they brought his bones uh, some 400 and something years back or after this event that's being spoken of right now so it tells us that something which is pe kind of peculiar he says one portion above your brothers which I took from the hand of the Amorite with the sword with my sword and my bow some people have referenced that to when uh, Simeon and Levi had gone in and and destroyed Shechem you remember the deal that had taken place with um, their sister and uh, how Shechem had had taken her and anyway looking at that story and the destruction that had taken place they'll ascribe that to having taken place from Jacob but I don't really believe that's the case. I believe that what Israel is doing here, or what Jacob is doing, is he's speaking prophetically with regard to something that would happen, but he's laying claim to it now. And the reason for that is that uh, he says, from the hand of the Amorite uh, with my sword and my bow. So if we uh, look at this in, in a specific sense, we we begin to see that the the prophecy that had come to Abraham in chapter 15 had to do with the Amorites and and the fact that there was um, a work that was taking place but the the sin of the Amorites hadn't been fulfilled yet or completed or or maxed out and so he's talking about the the fact that in Canaan the Amorites had control and they were bringing a bringing in idolatry and all sorts of problems into that area and that they were later to be 
there was a conquest that was going to take place from Joshua upon them. So that's what I believe that is making reference to here, that this uh, this conquering would would occur from Joshua upon the idolatry of the Amorites there in Canaan. So again, uh, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow, even though that's in present tense, it's prophetic and it's speaking forward to something that an event that that would end up taking place. Again, if you look at commentaries, you'll see both. You'll see, you might even find something beyond this, but this is generally, it's either what the brothers did in Shechem or it's something uh, going forward under Joshua. So it's fascinating in, in either sense how he views that. It does speak to the fact that, that if it's a blessing that he's making right now and saying that, or this is something, a conquest, and it's a blessing that's being given to Joseph that he sees today the things that haven't taken place yet, but that's how he views it. And that's exactly how the Father views you and I who are in Christ, that we are uh, washed in the blood of the Lamb, we're forgiven, that we're seated, seated at the right hand of the Father's, and we see of the Father, and we're, uh, we see that from... Uh, if no other books, at least the book of uh, Colossians, and there's just a, a profound emphasis upon how he sees us in real time with the work already being completed, even though we're caught in time past, you could sort of, you know, sort of say. So notice here, again, this, this idea where he says, Moreover, I've given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and my bow. And uh, just looking forward to what had taken place. And that sort of coincides with our closing verse, which I'm springing off of from verse 5, where Ephraim and Manasseh were considered to be Jacob's. They're mine, he says. And how this adoption is, being, uh, is occurring from grandsons to being elevated to this position as patriarchs and that that's how he saw it that's how he regarded it and that's how it was even though we could look and say no they're still just grandsons they're not they're not in that position so the closing verse for us is from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 through 5 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love verse 5 specifically having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will and basically what we're seeing here is just as the adoption from the grandchildren to patriarchs occurred that we've been adopted we were nothing before we were sons of Satan. We were completely on our own, and he's adopted us. And the way he views us is in a very high position, seated at the right hand of the Father, the bride of Christ, with him. And I hope that you're encouraged with that. I know I am. I love this set of verses and this, uh, this particular chapter. So God bless you, and let's uh, go ahead and close in prayer and and we'll wrap up lord jesus we thank you for your blessing and your goodness and your mercy upon us we thank you that you've adopted us into your kingdom that before even time began you knew who we were and you you did this work through jesus christ to seat us at your right hand with the son and that's an awesome thing we would certainly wouldn't want to be there without the son and we're thankful for jesus the work that he has done and that we're the bride to the bridegroom. May you be glorified, Lord, today, and may everybody who's received this message really receive it in their heart and be established in who you are. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, and thank you for watching the Calvary Chapel Louisville broadcast. Until next time, may God bless you, and don't forget to rejoice in the Lord always. Amen.